Hey, what's up everybody? Today we're going to be doing the States of Matter section of the 2024 Yosensio local exam. So this is from questions 13 through 18. Let's start with question 13. A white crystalline solid melts at 400 degrees Celsius and dissolves in water to give it an electrically conducting solution. Which is it? Now, in order for this solution to be electrically conducting, we need to have some sort of free ions. So whenever this solid is going to dissolve, it needs to dissolve into uh, different ions and it needs to dissolve to a pretty high extent. It could also be a metal, uh, but we'll find out later. So let, let's start going through our answer choices. The ones we can get rid of right away are going to be B and C. For B, this is a long carbon chain. This is not going to dissolve. Um, if, if you see a long carbon chain, you can pretty confidently assume that it's not going to dissolve much. And then silicon dioxide is a covalent um, compound, so it's not going to dissolve much either. Now, lithium hydroxide is very ionic. It's going to split up immediately into lithium plus and hydroxide ions. And so these ions can help uh, the solution conduct electricity. Our last option is copper. Now, copper is a metal. It has a bunch of free ions or free electrons that can uh, move around and uh, contribute to the electrically conducting property. But copper isn't white. So answer choice D is not it. Therefore, therefore, our answer is answer choice A. Let's move on to question 14. A 10 liter vessel containing 5 atmospheres of helium and a 3 liter vessel containing 10 atmospheres of argon are connected by a valve. The valve is open and the gases are allowed to mix at constant pressure. What is the final pressure in the vessels? So in this question, we have three different vessels. The first one is going to be your 10 liter one with 5 atmospheres of helium. Uh, you have another vessel that's 3 liters, which has uh, 10 atmospheres of argon. And then you have your final one, which is going to be the total. Uh, so it's going to be um, 13 liters. And we're trying to figure out what pressure this is going to be at. You can do this question entirely with the ideal gas law. So the ideal gas law tells you that PV equals nRT. So if, we're, if we can find how many moles of your helium is in this uh, chamber, in this vessel, how many moles of your argon are in this vessel, and we add them up and then we put them in this vessel, we can actually calculate the pressure of, uh, within, within this vessel. So what do I mean? Let's start. Let's start by uh, analyzing the first one. So we know that our number of moles is going to be PV over RT that just comes from rearranging this. And so for the first vessel, it's going to be five atmospheres times your 10 liters divided by R, which is a constant. Let me just neglect units for a second. Uh, we have R and then we have some sort of temperature. We don't know. Let's just leave it as T. So the number of moles in the first chamber N1 is going to be 50 over RT. Let's do the same process for the second one. So we have three, uh, sorry, 10 atmospheres and three liters divided by RT. So N2 is equal to 30 over RT. Now in the final vessel, we want to find the pressure. So let's rearrange the ideal gas law again for pressure. So P is going to equal NRT over V. And so the N, N total is going to be the sum of both the Ns that we just calculated. So 50 over RT plus 30 over RT, and that's going to be multiplied by RT and divided by the volume, which we know is 13 liters. I forgot the L here. Uh, and then if you can see, the RTs all cancel out. So you're left with 80 moles over 13 liters. It's technically not moles, so I won't write that. It's some other unit. But whatever you calculate, the calculation of this is going to provide a unit of atmospheres, of pressure. So 80 divided by 13 is going to be about 6.15 atmospheres. Uh, so our answer is answer choice C. A little side note about this question. You're given two noble gases, helium and argon. So that's why we're just able to kind of just add everything together and assume that there's not much interactions between the gases. Um, if there were interactions, this could change, but again, you could do all of this with the ideal gas law. And the fact that these are noble gases kind of uh, allows you to do that and be more confident about your answer. Let's move on to question 15. A mixture of A, whose molecules are represented by the rectangles, and B, whose molecules are represented by the ovals, 
is represented schematically below. What is the best description of this mixture? So from the diagram, you can see that A uh, is very ordered. Everything is oriented the same way. It's, they seem to be packed together efficiently. And then B, the ovals, are kind of all over the place. For A, you can immediately tell that this is going to be a crystalline solid. It's a solid because they're all very packed together and it's crystalline because everything is ordered the same way. They're all oriented the same way. So we know that A is going to be a crystalline solid and B, B looks a lot like a liquid. Everything is kind of all over the place. They're still together. So it's definitely not a gas where these would be much more far apart, but it doesn't seem to be a solid because they are a bit farther away from each other. And they're of course oriented in completely different ways. So this seems to be a liquid. And the best answer choice that reflects this is going to be answer choice B. So A is a crystalline solid in the presence of B, which is a liquid. Let's move on to question 16, which statement best describes a sample of ammonia at equilibrium at its triple point, which is 195.4 Kelvin and 0.0606 bar. Now this question has a bit of controversy because when you learn about the triple point, uh, which is shown in this diagram for a PT diagram of ammonia, I apologize for, for kind of being low quality, but what you usually learn about the triple point is that at the triple point, all three phases of a compound are in equilibrium with each other. Now, that is not entirely true. At the triple point, all three phases can exist, but it doesn't mean it necessarily has to exist. So the key with this question is to understand that we are at a relatively low pressure. A 0.0606 bar is relatively low. And at low pressures, it's very hard for liquids and solids to exist. If a liquid is at a very low, low pressure, it, has, it wants to minimize its free energy by turning into a gas. Uh, the same goes for solids. So if you had a solid at very low pressure, it would, kind of, it would want to turn into a gas to minimize its free energy. However, what must exist is the gas phase. The gas phase is very stable at, this, at these conditions. So gaseous ammonia must be present and solid or liquid ammonia may be present, but they don't necessarily have to be. Therefore, our answer is answer choice A. And that again comes from the fact that this is a pretty low pressure and you have to recognize that this is a low pressure. Again, this is kind of a controversial question, um, but it is technically correct that gaseous ammonia must be present but solid or liquid ammonia doesn't necessarily have to be present. I wouldn't beat yourself up if you got this question wrong. Let's move on to question 17. Which compound's lattice energy is largest in magnitude? So for this, you need to go to the uh, Coulomb's law, which tells you the force between two electrically charged compounds is equal to K, which is uh, Coulomb's constant, times the charges of your compounds divided by the square of the radius or the, the distance between them. So in order to have the highest lattice energy, we need to maximize the, the charges Q1, Q2, and we have to minimize the radius or the distance between the two uh, ions. Knowing this, we can immediately get rid of A and B. A and B because lithium and uh, fluorine are all gonna have a charge of negative one and plus one, or rather the other way around, uh, plus one, and negative one. So your Q value does not get maximized. And the same goes for sodium. Uh, sodium and chlorine, plus one, negative one. And in fact, this would be even worse because these are bigger compounds. So your R would be uh, even bigger. So now it's just between magnesium oxide and calcium sulfide. Uh, so magnesium oxide has a charge of, magnesium has a charge of plus two, oxygen has a charge of negative two, magnesium and oxide, and the same goes for calcium and sulfur. So how do we pick which one is going to have the largest lattice energy? Well, it's gonna be the one that minimizes the R squared value. We're looking for the smaller of the ions. So in order to get smaller, we have to go up the periodic table. So it would be magnesium and oxygen. Therefore, our answer is answer choice C. Let's move on to question 18. Uh, tantalum crystallizes in a body-centered cubic structure. How many nearest neighbors uh, does each tantalum atom have? Now, I have a diagram of a BCC uh, structure. Uh, I opted to not draw this because I think I'll mess this up. But you can clearly tell that each atom, which is the center atom, is going to have eight neighbors. So one, two, three, four, and I think you get the rest. 
but it's going to have eight neighbors. This just requires that you know what a, a BCC structure is, um, and your answer is answer choice C. And that was the whole States of Matter section. I hope this was helpful. I hope you were able to learn something. Please consider leaving a like and subscribing, and I'll see y'all later. Peace.